Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on our heritage.org website on all of these occasions. We would ask our in-house guests to make that courtesy check that our cell phones have been silenced. Oh, even the speaker doesn't think you'll get a call. That's good. <laughs> Uh, we remind our internet viewers, of course, that they are welcome to send questions or comments at any time, simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org, and of course, we will post the program on the Heritage homepage for your future reference. Introducing our guest today is Paul Larkin, who serves as the Senior Legal Research Fellow in our Edwin Meese Center for Legal and Judicial Studies. He directs our over-criminalization project, counter-abuse of the criminal law, particularly at the federal level. From 1984 to 93, he served at the Department of Justice as an assistant to the Solicitor General and as an attorney in the Criminal Division section on organized crime and racketeering. He has also argued 27 cases before the Supreme Court. He then served as counsel to the Senate Judiciary Committee and head of the Crime Unit for Senator Orrin Hatch, then the panel's chairman. He has also worked at the EPA and served in the private sector at two major Washington law firms. Please join me in welcoming Paul Larkin. Paul? Thank you. Thank you for those remarks, John. These events would not run as smoothly as they do were it not for someone like you always taking charge of things. Let me thank you all for coming. You have lots of things you can do with your day, and we appreciate the fact that you took time out of your day to come hear the professor talk about his book. You don't have to be Dr. Gregory House to know that people lie. <laughs> Early childhood educators say that a child who can tell a lie without a speck of guilt, or who, or who can engage in deceit without a hint of remorse, is likely heading down one of three paths in life a career in crime, a career in the intelligence community, or a career in law. The people who are best at it pursue a career in politics. And the creme de la creme even grow up to become president. Take President Obama, for example. President Obama said that the Paris attacks of last week were a setback in the war against terrorism. That's like saying the Titanic took on some water. President Obama said that having U.S. military aircraft drop ordnance on Libya was not an act of war against that nation. By that reasoning, if Libya bombed Washington, D.C., that would not be an act of war against America, unless perhaps Libya bombed the offices of the Democratic National Committee. Finally, President Obama told the nation repeatedly that if you like your health care plan, you can keep it under Obamacare. Remember what he told the annual conference of the American Medical Association in 2009. No matter how we reform health care, we will keep this promise to the American people. If you like your doctor, you will be able to keep your doctor, period. If you like your health care plan, you'll be able to keep your health care plan, period. No one will take that away, no matter what. He told that lie so often and so brazenly that the Pinocchio meter died from overexertion. President Obama's remarks were like saying the following, no matter how we reform health care, we will keep this promise to the American people. If you want to live forever, you will be able to do so under Obamacare, period. No, no one will take it away, no matter what. Lying to the nation, however, is not even President Obama's worst fault. He has so often disregarded the law and has so often taken the law into his own hands that it is almost no longer a newsworthy event because it has become commonplace and boring. Today, however, we will be reminded of President Obama's perfidy and outlawry. Our guest is Professor David Bernstein. Professor Bernstein is the George Mason University Foundation Professor at the George Mason Law School. He is a graduate of the Yale Law School, where he was senior editor of the Yale Law Journal and was a John M. Olin Fellow in Law, Economics, and Politics. He is the author of more than 60 scholarly articles, book chapters, and think tank studies, published in journals such as the Yale Law Journal, 
the Northwestern University Law Journal, the Georgetown Law Journal, the North Carolina Law Review, and the Journal of Law and Contemporary Problems. Professor Bernstein is also the author of several books, such as Rehabilitating Lochner, Defending Individual Rights Against Progressive Reform, and You Can't Say That, The Growing Threat to Civil Liberties from Anti-Discrimination Laws. Please join me in giving the professor a warm welcome. Hi, thank you all for coming today. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the broad issues raised in the book, go into some more detail about them, and then try to describe why I think the Obama administration has been as lawless as it has. So even as the partisan political divide continues to widen, one thing has long united Democratic and Republican presidents, which is aggressively expanding their own prerogatives at the expense of the other branches and sometimes of the rule of law itself. We can't pretend that Obama is the first one to do that. As presidential power has grown since approximately Teddy Roosevelt's day in the early 20th century, so has the abuse of presidential power. Congress tried to enact a series of reforms in the 1970s after Watergate and Vietnam to try to curb presidential unilateralism and subordinate the presidency to Congress's legislative authority. But these reforms were largely ineffective. Nevertheless, though, one thing we could say is that it seemed that pres our presidents, though not always acting lawfully, at least generally felt constrained to obey the law and enforce the law, at least to pretend they were doing so. Unfortunately, we seem to have reached a tipping point with the Obama administration. The administration has been especially aggressive about asserting presidential power and about doing so in lawless ways in an unusually wide range of policy areas. Consider just a few examples. Paul already mentioned the war in Libya. So we have a law called the War Powers Act, which requires the president to inform Congress when the, he's putting American forces in the way of hostilities and then withdraw the soldiers within 90 days if... Um, the Congress doesn't agree, and the president ignored that law. I'll talk more about that shortly. The president appointed policy czars to avoid the constitutionally required confirmation hearings for high-level officials that require them. He modified, delayed, and ignored, and continues to do so, various provisions of Obamacare in defiance of the law itself. He attacked private citizens for engaging in constitutionally protected speech, issued through the Department of Education, draconian regulations regarding sexual assault on campus, not through formal regulation as required under the Administrative Procedure Act, but through an informal, unreviewable, hap haphazard, really, dear colleague letter from one bureaucrat, ignored 100 years of advice from the Office of Legal Counsel and the plain text of the Constitution to try to get a vote in Congress for the D.C. representative, has tried, of course, to enact massive immigration reform by refusing not only to enforce existing immigration law, but also the grant work permits to those who are then allowed to stay, has imposed common core educational standards on the states by administrative fiat. You'll note, well, where is the congressional debate about this? There wasn't any, uh, because it was just done via the Department of Education unilaterally. Uh, and much, much more. Uh, more is enumerated in the book. I know that was quite a laundry list, so I'm just going to pick out three of those and elaborate on them more. First, uh, let me go with the example that's not widely known but very telling, and that's this issue of trying to give the D.C. delegate a vote in the House of Representatives. In April 2009, just a few months after Inauguration Day, the administration decided to push for a law that would give a D.C. delegate, currently Eleanor Holmes Norton, uh, a vote in the House of Representatives. The Constitution, however, limits voting authority in Congress to the citizens of the several states. Of course, D.C. is not a state, but a federal district, and it can't have, therefore, a voting representative in Congress unless we were going to do something like chop off part of it and give it to Maryland. But as long as it stays the way it is, it can't have a vote. Now, this is not really controversial. Attorneys in the Office of Legal Counsel, which is the president's uh, legal advisors in each administration, and one of the few potential constraints on executive action, told him that you can't do this. And not only do we say you can't do this, we have a long line of OLC memos dating back like 100 years saying you can't do this. This has not been controversial uh, in the executive branch ever. 
And the plain text of the Constitution, like we said, also suggests otherwise. Now, the OLC is one of the few really, relatively, I should say, independent checks on the president's exercise of power. As an executive branch agency stacked, at least in part, with political appointees, it tries to bend over backwards to tell the president, you can do what you want to do. It's not out there to try to stop the president, but just to say, here are the outer boundaries of reason and what you could do. So when the OLC says the president can't do something, presidents almost always say, well, if the OLC, my own lawyers, who, most of whom I appoint are telling me I can't do it, then I shouldn't. But instead of deferring to the OLC, Attorney General Eric Holder took the unusual step of going to the Solicitor General's office for a second opinion. But of course, he didn't go and ask the Solicitor General's office, do you think this is constitutional? Because A, that's not what the Solicitor General's office does, and B, he knew that the answer would be, of course not. Uh, he asked the Solicitor General instead, can you defend this in court? The Solicitor General's standard for defending something in court is, is this so preposterous? that no reasonable lawyer could defend this with a straight face. And the D.C. issue, while clear, is not that. So, of course, the Solicitor General's office said, well, it's not so preposterous that we couldn't defend it in court. Maybe we could come up with some constitutional arguments, whatever. Um, and Holder then gave the president the green light to endorse the voting bill. Now, the reason you probably haven't heard about this is that very little is at stake. There's only one vote in the House. There's almost never a tie vote in the House. If there was a tie vote someday and the D.C. delegate who is now representative uh, had cast that deciding vote, a court would have almost inevitably said, well, this law is unconstitutional because the D.C. representative's vote can't be the tiebreaker because they're not allowed to vote. So in the end, it would have meant nothing except it was sort of a political sop to Democratic constituencies who have been eager to get the mostly Democratic district more political power. So it's a purely sort of symbolic measure to satisfy Democratic constituencies. So in short, Holder was ready and willing to undermine his own Office of Legal Counsel and its decade-old, widely accepted understanding of the Constitution. And this suggested right at the start of the Obama administration that political considerations, no matter how petty, would trump the Constitution and the rule of law. Speaking of which, we get again to Libya. So the president wanted to bomb Libya for reasons that still escape me why, why we were involved there, but that's another issue. Uh, so the War Powers Act required Cong the president to go to Congress and say, hey, we're putting, we're involved in hostilities in Libya, we have 90 days. Now, I know some of my friends at Heritage think the War Powers Act is unconstitutional, and I respect that view, I'm not sure I agree, but I respect it, but the nice thing about an administration arguing the law is unconstitutional is that applies to everybody. So if you argue the War Powers Act is unconstitutional for us, it also means that when Republicans are in power, it would be unconstitutional for them, and they could do whatever they want also. This is something the Obama administration has consistently not done. And I, I don't agree with John Yu and others that were in the Bush administration about their really broad views of executive power, but they've been consistent. They said, yes, we thought that Bush had the right to do this without Congress, now we think that Obama has the right to do it without Congress. What Obama's trying to do instead is come up with rules that only apply to him, for his special circumstances with ridiculous legal arguments that uh, could be limited to what he's doing that will never come up again. So the argument that Obama wanted was that somehow the War Powers Act doesn't apply to me in this circumstance, even though it pretty clearly did. The problem was that the OLC said, of course it applies. What are you talking about? Hostilities, you're bombing Libya a lot. So he went to the Defense Department lawyers who not to pro who you know we wouldn't think would be inclined to want to not go to war. Right? That's what they do. And they said, no, you can't do that. You actually have to go to Congress. So the president trolled around until he found a lawyer in the administration willing to say the War Powers Act didn't apply. And the crazy thing is that he found a guy named Harold Coe. Harold Coe is the State Department legal advisor who's also the former dean of Yale Law School. Now, two things you should know about Harold Coe. The first is that he made his own name in his career uh, by arguing that the president needs to defer to Congress a lot more in foreign affairs. The second thing is that he specifically argued in his book, The National Security Constitution, his first big book that made his academic reputation, that when President Reagan bombed Libya for a whole 12 minutes in 1986, that the War Powers Act was implicated. So somehow between 1986 and 2010, we went from 12 minutes of bombing implicating the War Powers Act to months of bombing not implicating it. And the theory was, well, this doesn't constitute hostilities because we're above the hostilities. 
we're not there. We don't have ground. Somehow only ground forces count, which is implausible just as a matter both of what the word hostilities mean and also if you look at legislative history, it was clearly meant to apply broadly. Congress, in fact, was upset about the bombing of Cambodia without its authorization, and that also was above the hostilities under that reasoning. So that was, that's really just, you know, just an appalling example of the president not, you know, ignoring his own lawyers, trolling for somebody, then endorsing a ridiculous argument that happens to suit what he wants to do. Finally, the third example I'm going to focus on is this issue of sexual, sexual assault on college campuses. Because here we have the administration requiring every single country, every single campus in the United States, with the exception of two or three that don't take any federal funds, including student loans, to completely rewrite their understanding of what to do if someone's accused of sexual harassment. And this happened solely because of a single letter sent by a single bureaucrat in the Department of Education Office of Civil Rights that starts, Dear Colleagues. Dear Colleagues, Title IX bans is essentially what it says, sex discrimination uh, in higher education, therefore it bans sexual harassment, sexual assault is a particular pernicious form of sexual harassment, and therefore, and here's where the therefore doesn't work, and therefore, here are specific rules that, even though we can't say any statutes or any court cases that require you to do this, here are specific rules you now have to adhere to. Mo most famously, they said you can't use any standard for determining whether someone is guilty of sexual assault on campus that is higher than preponderance of the evidence. Right, more probably than not. Uh, most courts, most campuses use before that clear and convincing. That's not the most troubling thing about these guidelines, though. The most troubling thing is that they require universities to use rules of evidence that would be laughed out of any courtroom in the United States as violating the due process rights of the litigants. In particular, A, uh, colleges are severely discouraged from allowing any cross-examination of the complainant which makes it very hard in a he said, she said case to possibly defend yourself because you can't cross-examine the person accusing you. What, what else do you have, really? And even worse, uh, they, they absolutely ban under their guidelines the, com the defendant from bringing in any evidence of any prior sexual activity by the complainant other than with the accused. So why is that so terrible? Uh, we don't want you know, to go back to the old days where we're putting the victim on trial, but just imagine, for example, a case where a cell phone video surfaces on campus and gets spread around of a man and woman engaging in what many would consider to be a um, unpleasant and or deviant or uh, whatever word you want to use, something that someone would be embarrassed about sexual act on the part of the woman. And the complainant, once this video is out, then files a, cl a claim. This was sexual assault. This was not voluntary. And she says to the investigators, I would never engage in this degrading sexual act. The investigators for the defendant find four other men who are willing to testify that this woman engaged in exactly the same sexual act with them in any courtroom in the United States in a civil or criminal case, no matter how restrictive their rape shield rules are, you would be allowed to bring this evidence because it's very good evidence, it's very important evidence to prove yourself uh, innocent. You would not be allowed to bring that in under the guidelines that have been imposed in every university. So we have two real problems here. The first is that we have a law that violates all common notions of due process imposes on universities. Uh, so we have the administration violating due process, but then we also have it, have it that it's a completely lawless way of doing it because there's no law that's been passed. There was no notice and comment period. There was no publication in the Federal Register. It was a letter sent by a bureaucrat saying, here's what we expect you to do. And they treated this letter as if it was binding, even though it could not be. And they treated it as, treated it as if it were binding until two Department of Education officials recently testified before Congress, and they were asked about this, and they admitted that it's not binding, it's not a regulation, it's just a letter. And now there's a footnote on the website where they have this posted, saying, oh, by the way, this isn't really binding. They, they sort of don't quite say this explicitly as they should, but they've sort of now admitted it years after it officially first came out, and, years, and of course after all the universities have already changed all their policies. So the question is, having gone through some of these examples, and of course there's a lot more in the book, why is the Obama administration been lawless in these different ways? And I think part of the problem is that Obama faces a significant ideological barrier to adhering to the rule of law and constitutional constraints on his authority. He and many of the administration's top lawyers come from an intellectual tradition on the liberal left that is very skeptical of traditional notions of the Constitution and fidelity to it and the rule of law. As I'm sure most of you know, on the constitutional front, liberals and progressives Progressives have long argued that the Constitution has no fixed meaning, that 
uh, theories that focus on the Constitution's original objective meaning are nonsense, and that the Constitution is a living document that must evolve with the times. Well, if you believe that, then what does constitutional fidelity really mean? Second problem is that progressives have had similar problems with the concept of the rule of law. The rule of law used to be a big thing in liberal circles, and it's maintained by following the laws in ways that promote consistency and stability, ensuring equal treaties of, par by, of different parties, and in our system, ensuring the separation of powers. Right? We have three different branches. They have to stay to their own roles. The rule of law has been in declining... Um, favor within liberal circles, and I'll give you one example to show you that this is true, which is the um, lawyer, the mission statement of the leading liberal lawyers organization, the American Constitution Society. What do they say about the rule of law? Well, our mission, they say, is to promote, quote, the vitality of the U.S. Constitution and the fundamental values, weasel word it expresses, individual rights and liberties, genuine equality, access to justice, democracy, and the rule of law. Now, at least the rule of law is in there. But note that it gets no more attention or uh, it's put on the same plane as things like access to justice and genuine equality, whatever that might mean, and therefore you have to sort of uh, balance each of them against each other. The rule of law is not some sort of absolute value that we need to adhere to. And this didn't happen by accident, but it's a product of, a long, of long standing ideological trends on the left. The importance and even coherence of the concept of the rule of law came under a series of attacks in the legal academy starting in the mid-1970s. First, the, in, in particular, there was the legal, Critical Legal Studies Movement, or CLS. CLS is the intellectual descendant of the pre-World War II realists. Now, in the very crude versions, the realists say, well, law is meaningless. It all depends on what the judge had for breakfast. It's all indeterminate. That's the crude version. The less crude version, which is uh, probably not wrong, is that there is a lot more going on in legal interpretation than simply looking at precedent and, and the text. There are political values and economic values and so forth and so on. Nevertheless, legal realism fell out of favor after World War II, right, because we just dealt with the Nazis, uh, uh, and the Nazis, uh, the legal realists all came out of a Germanic tradition, that, and people say, well, maybe this wasn't the best idea. Maybe this is, it turns out to be a little nihilistic and, you know, not constraining on uh, authority if we undermine this idea that the law as actually meaningful in and of itself. But by the 1970s, we had sort of forgotten all about that, and uh, the ideas of legal realism made a comeback in a variety of formats, but in particular, it found a home in the CLS movement among young left-wing academics. As law professor Charles Barzun of UVA explains, uh, the adherents to CLS argued, quote, that the rule of law was both impossible in practice and in any event undesirable in theory. Why? Because it was just a stalking horse for the class interests of the elite. Uh, the first invitation to a CLS conference in 1977 declared that law is an instrument of social, economic, and political domination, both in the sense of furthering the concrete interests of the dominator and in that of legitimating the existing order. So we could sum this sensibility up as law is politics, politics is law, there's no distinction, we just pretend there is. Now, if that's what you think of law, it's pretty obvious why the concept of, of the rule of law is not appealing. Uh, CLS is distaste of the rule of law was also embraced by two new movements, radical legal feminism and critical race theory, both of which adopted the law as politics mantra. Now these various groups of critical legal scholars, their influence happened to be at its peak right when I was in law school. Why do you care about that? Because it was actually right when Barack Obama was in law school, not coincidentally, I think. It's not a complete coincidence that uh, the president and many of his closest advisors were in the law school environment when these ideas had their most... Um, oomph, basically. Uh, and even though a majority of even liberal professors never adopted this, their influence was widely felt. While most modern progressive thinkers have not formally abandoned commitment to the rule of law, you could tell, even when people are arguing about, is Obama doing the right thing, is he not doing the right thing legally, what people argue is, well, he came up with a legal argument. And a legal argument is not completely absurd. Therefore, he's not violating the rule of law. That's not what the rule of law is. The rule, at least tradi as traditionally conceived, the, law, the rule of law is not before the government could do something, we must find some not completely inter absurd interpretation of existing law that allows us to do it, but actually looking to the law first, figuring out what does the law say objectively, and then figuring out whether you could do it, what, what you could do, not putting, not putting the cart before the horse, so to speak. Now, even this version of the liberal rule of law puts some constraints on the government, assuming that 
the president's willing to listen to his legal advisors, which he isn't always. So even with the immigration reform, OLC did say, look, this is as far as we could possibly stretch the law. You want to allow 8 million people to stay here, uh, we can only do four and a half. You have to take that or leave it. So there's some constraints. But it's really ultimately more like the rule of clever and politically willful lawyers than the rule of law as traditionally conceived. Now, some of you may be saying to yourself, well, Professor Bernstein, surely other presidents have also tried to figure out what they want to do first and then tried to figure out what an interpretation of the law that will allow them to do that, and I certainly acknowledge that. What is different about the Obama administration, top officials and the president himself, is that when he does this, he doesn't do it surreptitiously, oh, I'm really obeying the law and truly really trying, or um, something that you do but you're sort of ashamed of doing it, but something to brag about, something that is in fact a desirable way of governing is if ignoring the separation of powers and the law as written in the statute books in favor of presidential decree and executive order, as if promoting progressive political ends at the expense of the rule of law, is proper not simply as, oh, it's just politics or perhaps a desperate last resort because those Republicans are stopping us, but as a matter of principle. Right? If you read President Obama's speeches, he keeps talking about, we can't wait for Congress to act, so we're just going to go ahead and do it. We can, he, even, he even calls these my we can't wait speeches. Where, you know, I'm looking for the we can't wait clause in the Constitution that says that if, we, that if the president says we can't wait, that allows you to govern unilaterally without Congress. Worse yet, as Professor Jonathan Turley at GW has written, the Obama administration acts as if anything a court has not expressly forbidden is permissible. Right? So we have this notion the rule of law is only enforced by the courts when, in fact, the president himself has the responsibility to uh, execute his oath of office to adhere to the Constitution. The problem, of course, is that even if we could rely on the judges, a lot of things the president does are simply not reviewable by courts. There's no one who has standing. And therefore, there's no judge that could stop the administration from law-breaking or failing to enforce the law. So when the president says, he's being a wise guy, he says, oh, you don't like what I'm doing, so sue me, when he knows that in many cases, no one can sue him. Now, Obama's allies, no doubt, would pose the dilemma this way. For example, let's take uh, the measures that Obama has taken to prop up Obamacare, delaying, modifying, changing all different provisions without any real legal authority to do so. Obama would probably say, well, look, this law is giving millions of people health insurance, and if we could find a way to do it where courts won't strike it down, shouldn't we be doing that? And this sort of the end, ends of justifies the means reasoning is kind of understandable, right, if you're, trying to, if you're trying to help people and your law is doing so. But it neglects the long-term damage of undermining legal restraints has on uh, protecting... It neglects the long-term damage that undermining legal restraints on the president in favor of protecting certain poli uh, current political agenda, however worthy that agenda seems to advocates. We had no choice but to seize power to help the people is exactly the rhetoric and reasoning used to every, by every two-bit tyrant around the world. And I should say that I'm pretty confident that almost, literally almost no one, maybe no one, who is currently saying the president is justified doing this because Obamacare is so important, or because Congress is so obstreperous, or because Congress isn't functional, or because we have such partisanship, almost no one who says this, and maybe no one will say the same thing if President uh, Marco Rubio or President Ted Cruz tries to do the same thing. This is not a principled argument. This argument has a shelf life until January 20th, uh, 2019, at least if the Republicans win next time. So ultimately, the Obama administration's cavalier attitude toward the rule of law can only be justified if one thinks that law is, in fact, just politics. Law is politics. Politics is law. And if that's what Obama and his appointees ultimately believe, then maybe the critical legal scholars have won after all. Thank you. Professor, let me uh, exercise the prerogative of the chair and, and ask a few questions to get the discussion going. Uh, for years, conservatives have tried to persuade the Supreme Court to limit the ability of private parties to sue. Uh, you have to establish that you have been particularly injured by something the government has done uh, in order to establish standing to sue, a technical legal term. Uh, is part of the problem that this this whole long-term development has now come home to roost, that when the president can decide just to do these things, he does so fully knowing that no one can do anything in uh, the court to 
keep him from doing what he wants. And so, in essence, conservatives have damaged their, their abil uh, the ability of the law to be enforced simply by depriving plaintiffs of the opportunity to sue. Right, well, standing is a complicated issue, and there are reasons to limit standing. And in particular, uh, even in the Obama administration, we have it despite the standing rules. You have a problem where you could have collusion, essentially, between plaintiffs uh, and administrative agencies where the plaintiff sues and someone maybe who isn't even injured sues and says, we really think your rule should be this way. And the um, the Exactly, the agency in question actually would like the rules to be that way, but Congress won't permit it, or the statute won't permit it, so they then do what they call sue and settle. Well, now they reach a settlement that says they'll do it this way, and they sort of legislate without having to go to Congress, or in fact, in defiance of what Congress has said. So there are legitimate reasons to be concerned about standing, um, but I think it's one thing to reject standing when you have someone asking the government to do something, as in these sue and settle cases, and another when you're trying to say what, what the what the president or the executive branch is doing is illegal uh, as such, and they shouldn't be allowed to exercise this power regardless of exactly what the policy is. And the problem is, I mean, I think conservatives have been right that uh, when it comes to these inter intra inter-branch disputes between the president and Congress and whatnot, that uh, these were not meant in general by the framers to be subject to judicial review, that Congress is supposed to protect its authority through its power of the purse and through other political means. The problem is, uh, and forgive me, James Madison, the framers screwed it up uh, because they thought that the different branches would be protective of their own prerogatives. And from much of American history, they were, and now they're not. And there's two, and the framers didn't anticipate the party system, so that's the biggest problem. And it's worse than just having a party system now. We have a polarized party system where basically all the liberals are on one side, all the conservatives on the other. We used to have much more mixed parties, <coughs> so it's harder for administrations to get away with things. Now, uh, people's ideological interest in Congress matches their political interest. So what do we have? We have a situation where basically you can almost guarantee that whatever President Obama does, all the Democrats or almost all the Democrats in Congress are going to defend him no matter how illegal it is. And similarly, frankly, with Republicans. There aren't gonna be that if, if we had a president who was doing illegal things on the, on the Republican side, it's unlikely Republicans in Congress would do anything about it. So impeachment then becomes impossible because I mean, you can impeach in the House, but you'll never get two thirds in the Senate, except in the rare, rare, rare case, only once in American history has there ever been a Senate that was two thirds the opposite party of the president, and that led to the near conviction of Andrew Johnson uh, in the 1860s. Uh, so impeachment's out of the question, and, and now the power of the purse isn't really useful anymore either, uh, because it turns out we do have an anti-deficiency act, which prohibits the president from spending money that wasn't allocated, and you know what? No one has standing to challenge this uh, when the president violates it. So with regard to Libya, for example, not only did the president not invoke the War Powers Act, not ask for a declaration of war, he didn't even ask Congress for money. He just took money from another Defense Department account and moved it over. Now, you can't do that legally, but who's to say you can't do that if the president refuses to restrain himself? Who's going to stop him? So I think that, you know, originalists may disagree. They may say, well, we have to just stick to the way things were, but I think if the Supreme Court, Supreme Court standing jurisprudence is to some extent prudential, uh, looking at what the uh, causes, the effect, why we might want standing and what the effects will be. And I think that given that the standard view of things that Congress will protect its prerogatives is no longer so operative. I should say also, a couple of years ago, at his State of the Union address, President Obama said, I'm going to ignore Congress whenever I need to, whenever I, whenever I want to, and use my pen and start signing things. All the Democrats in Congress got up and applauded. Just give them a standing ovation. I'm taking away all your power. That's great, yay, because you're a Democrat. So this is not working out uh, the way the framers intended. So given that uh, fact, if we want to keep the balance of power as it's supposed to be, we actually may need to liberalize standing rules. Well, let me ask you a follow-up then. Every now and then Congress or one of the chambers tries to bring a lawsuit against the president. Generally speaking, they've been unsuccessful in persuading courts to resolve these disputes. But are we heading in that direction where you're going to see this more and more often? that whenever you have a, a Congress or at least one chamber that uh, has a majority of the party that's not the president's, you're going to see these disputes being brought to court to try to have them adjudicated? 
I all the best. I think it depends on how successful they are. You know, obviously, if the courts keep shooting them down, and eventually the Supreme Court says uh, we're not going to hear cases like this, it'll eventually die out. But it's interesting because you know the, the biggest problem we have with standing is that t the general taxpayer doesn't have standing. The president could be spending money in a completely illegal and constitutional way. And a case, this is not a modern case really, but it is a progressive era case. The case going back to the 1920s says the average person can't sue. So uh, it's actually a clever thing, though, to say, well, as a member of Congress, maybe the individual taxpayer doesn't have any uh, harm that, that's unique. But as a member of Congress, my political authority is being undermined by the fact that we passed a law that says one thing, the president's doing something else. So I, you know, we'll have to see how this works out, but it's not a completely implausible way of getting these disputes into court. Let me now turn it to the audience. Do anyone from the audience have any questions? Sir, if you could just wait for a minute, we'll get you a microphone. Please just identify yourself and ask a short question. Yes, my name is Joel Hetker, retired government. Uh, I'm thinking back to 1937 when FDR tried to pack the court, and uh, that was his, his intent was to have 15 justices. And Garner, who was the vice president, and I think the Senate Majority Leader Robertson, he said, no, we can't do this. We don't have the votes in, in, in Congress to, to permit that. And, of course, they were all Democrats. Then you have Truman with his seizure case, Youngstown Sheet and Tube, versus Sawyer, who was the Secretary of Commerce. And uh, I don't know, well, I, I think that in, that I, I believe that was 1951, that case. And I believe it was, I think the Congress was Democratic. And every justice, was, every justice on the Supreme Court was a Democrat then, too. Okay. Well, uh, I'm trying to set a historical precedent. Even going back to the Myers case under Wilson. The president has the power to appoint and the power to remove. He was his post, postmaster. Uh, does this tie in with your arguments that some of these? Well, you know, oddly enough, while uh, Roosevelt's court packing plan was a brazen attempt to pack the court uh, on his own, on the behalf of his own policies. There's actually nothing illegal about it. There's nothing in the Constitution that says how many members the, Constitu the, the court could have. And again, one advantage of this kind of thing, of brazenly doing, you know, it could be the brazen theory of John Yu that the president can't be restrained with regard to foreign affairs or war at all, or it could be the brazen theory of uh, brazen, Franklin Roosevelt brazenly changing the court. Once you do that, it applies to everybody. Once there were 15 justices or, uh, and it was switched shifted around, there'd be nothing to stop President Eisenhower from pointing, from proposing similar legislation and getting more or less or whatever. So there's something to be said for, act, for having real constitutional conflict between Congress uh, and the President, and the President setting forth a constitutional theory says, here's what I believe I'm allowed to do, uh, and I'm setting forth a theory that will apply not just to me, but to everyone. And then if Republicans... Uh, with the presidency, they'll be able to do it too. And the nice thing about that too, if it does get to the courts, the justices, unlike the president, are not short-term players, right? Obama's concerned only about what goes on. I'm surprised, actually, given that he was a constitutional law professor himself, but as far as I could tell, he's not really concerned what will happen after he leaves office. A lot of liberal Democrats are. This whole immigration thing, a lot of law professors who are liberals are up in arms about it. It's like, well, what happens if President Cruz decides uh, that... Or, or with Obamacare also. I'm not going to force certain provisions of Obamacare. What if President Cruz just announced by executive order or better yet by Friday afternoon blog post, as the Obama administration has done in some cases? Uh, you know, I think the capital gains tax should be zero, but Congress won't go along. I'm just going to announce that anyone who doesn't pay capital gains taxes won't be prosecuted. I'm ordering the IRS not to prosecute them or make any civil fines or anything else. What's to stop it from doing that? It's a terrible precedent. And if it got to court, I think even the liberal Democrats on the court would say, well, we don't want this power because we're not so concerned with what happens the next year and a half. We're concerned with the next 50 years, and that will be a lot of Republicans also. Okay. Uh, in the back there, Chris. Hello, David. Chris Lundineal. How are you? Good. You um, referenced your, uh, your law school and, and uh, Mr. Obama's law school, and how what uh, Mr. Obama learned in the early 90s may have affected his viewpoint, which is to say that uh, what is taught in a law school seems to be important not just at the federal level but at the state level, what people believe the Constitution says. Uh, in that regard, what is your sense, other than at George Mason, which has a wonderful <laughs> record in this regard, uh, as to the possibilities of uh, people who believe in fidelity to law and in, in logic, and, and the sort of things we've been talking about today, being able to actually uh, find positions to teach 
the, the new young lawyers coming out, so more of them will not think in this awful way? Uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, there's a fair amount of discrimination in the legal academic world against people who have conservative views, especially in public law areas and especially in constitutional law. Nevertheless, there's less discrimination in law schools than there is in many other academic fields. Uh, and I think it's also the case that once you actually get into academia, uh, the, the word I have from my friends who are conservatives, libertarians, is that they've always been treated cordially and fairly by their colleagues once they're in. They understand that they may have been discriminated against in the process. They may f witness discrimination against new candidates, but, you, but we, there's generally some mutual respect once you've actually become part of the club. So uh, I do think that schools like Yale, my alma mater, are doing a disservice uh, by, I think, fairly clearly discriminating. I mean, Yale Law School, let's put it this way, Yale Law School, in my lifetime, literally in my lifetime, not just in my adulthood, has not hired a conservative or libertarian scholar in public law. I'm not sure they've ever had one since the law school was founded. Uh, in 1930, you know, the modern incarnation was 1933. And they have uh, had... I have a friend at the law school who tells me that there are people who will block any such candidates. And I think they're doing a disservice to their students because the students are not being exposed to the other ideas. And they're doing a disservice uh, to the school itself uh, because it would be, you know, half, half the time Republicans are going to win and, they're not gonna, and the school itself is not going to be part of those debates when the other side is discussing them and they're not going to have any influence. So I think it's a problem. But I think it goes, I mean, I, but I think, you know, one issue that we have with President, I have with President Obama, one thing I mentioned in the book, is I really think that because he went to institutions like Harvard Law School, like Columbia University, he has a very skewed idea of what the respectable political spectrum is. So one of my favorite Obama quotes is when he was asked about his ties to the unrepentant domestic terrorist Bill Ayers and in a debate back in, I think, April 2008. He said, oh, yeah, well, I know him, but you know, I'm, I'm, fr I'm friendly to him. But you know, I'm also friendly with Tom Coburn. Right, as if someone who was a literally a domestic terrorist who hasn't repented from his views in the, that regard is the left-wing equivalent of a relatively mainstream, law-abiding conservative senator. Used to be enough for you, not to get a security you would think so, you know. But but at some I mean, I went to Yale. The same uh, Yale was actually a little more saying that in those days in, in Harvard. Uh, uh, but in, you know, the political spectrum was if you were on the radical left, you were sort of you know, a little bit liberal. If you were sort of what we consider very liberal, like Obama, you would be sort of moderate. And if you were anything to the right of, say, Michael Dukakis, uh, or or you know, Ray Jim Webb today, you were considered some sort of extremist. So when President Obama says things like what he said about Coburn, when he tells people, "Oh, I don't know why people think I'm ideological," I mean, after all, I was a, you know at Harvard Law School, I was a moderate. That's the no, that's the re respectable political spectrum that I know. Andrew. Hi, thanks. Um, Andrew Kloster with the Heritage Foundation. I'd like to <coughs> go back to something that was the question before this, but a little bit of what you just mentioned in, in this, in your response to the last questioner, um, which is you said the president, you don't think the president um, is concerned with what's going to happen after his administration. He's going to tear everything down and then there'll be nothing left. Um, and, and you could have the next president buy executive fiat, repeal the capital gains tax, for example. Um, I actually think, personally, I think that is strategic. I think the idea is to politicize and to make everything within the bounds of reasonable political discourse. And let me give you just a few examples, and which are on the very, very minor side, which I think everyone thinks is within the president's authority. Renaming Mount, Mount McKinley, the $10 bill, for example. Um, those are both things which were settled for a very, very long time, but they were just changed like this, and they were changed in a public way, I think, to politicize them so that there's nothing to rest on. Um, so I just like your thoughts on, I mean, does this seem like a plausible interpretation of the strategic aim, which is to put everything, all reasonable bounds of legal discourse on the table as political and arguable over um, so that everything gets pushed into the public square so that tensions get more and more divided in the long term? But the, you know, the, the, the question is why would, you know, I don't disagree that that seems to be what's going on, that the president... Uh, is contemptuous of, con I mean, Congress may be contemptuous of the president, that's another story, but the president is contemptuous of Congress. And I thought this just from my own reading and then uh, about him, and then it turns out that uh, uh, Leon Panetta said the same thing in his book, which came out right when I was writing my book, and someone, I forget who, some other uh, uh, Obama administration official just came up with another book where he said, yeah, he just doesn't want to work with the Republicans because he thinks they're not 
interested in helping the country. They're just crazy extremists who have this ideological agenda. They don't care if it helps the country or not. But the question is, so one problem is I think that he thinks this is my chance. Maybe these crazy people will be in power later and I better do whatever I can. But still, there used to be this tradition of legal liberalism that really was more farsighted and said, well, look, whatever we like to do right now, we don't know who's going to be in power in the future. We don't know what the situation is going to be. We want to establish some ground rules. Uh, and those ground rules, some of them are legal rules, and some of them are just norms uh, of what we could do. Like, we could argue back and forth about the legality of the president's immigration executive order. I think that the anti uh, has a better legal argument, but it's not a complete, he doesn't have a completely implausible argument like he does in some cases. But it is against all legal norms. And the president and the OLC said, well, there are other presidents who have granted people basically temporary residency and work permits uh, in the past. Yeah, there were two big differences there. One was we were talking about, at most, tens of thousands of people, not millions of people. And number two, in each of those cases, for example, when Cuban refugees were coming over in the early 60s, and there was no provision for them in the law yet, so you theoretically have to send them home. The president was working with Congress to pass legislation, not working against Congress. Here, Congress declined to pass specifically what the president wants to do. So even if you can do it, even if you can make the argument, I think it's legally justified, no president, I think, in the past would have been so bold to have so much chutzpah to say, well, I'm going to ignore Congress and just legalize at least as long as I can four and a half million people and give them work permits. Similar with Common Core. Uh, you know, the, well, you know, the No Child Left Behind law says, we'll, here are the standards you have to meet. If you don't meet them, you're going to be in big trouble financially uh, unless we give you a waiver. That doesn't say what the criteria for waivers are. So the president says, well, my criteria is you have to adopt Common Core. Because Common Core, good idea or bad idea, not relevant to my book. The, I, the, the point is that education, which has always been a traditional state and local function, is not the kind of thing where you would expect a president, even if they can make the argument that they have the legal authority to do so, to just ignore Congress entirely, not have any public debate, and just through a regulation decide the curriculum for almost every student in, the, in, in public school in the United States. So there is this contempt not just for the law, but also for legal norms, which I think is what you're getting at. Uh, and, you know, this is a danger. This is playing with fire, right? I mean, uh, I, I don't think these people will be happy if President Cruz uh, goes the other way, but maybe the same way, but maybe they're thinking, well, the media will have... Uh, a field day with this, the way they don't care what, what, about what we do, which is, again, another problem. Let me ask a question. Um, do you think this transition that you've talked about is, is going to come back again? In the 1960s, uh, liberals made a variety of different arguments in court, and they were able to have a great deal of success with the Warren Court in various areas, dealing with the application of the Bill of Rights in criminal cases, uh, and so forth. The, uh, the voting cases where they were able to persuade the court to apply the Equal Protection Clause in voting areas. One area, of course, that they pushed but they failed to succeed was, for example, in, in creating welfare rights uh, to, you know, welfare assistance, adequate homes, adequate education, etc. They tried that in, late in the 60s, but then in the 70s, when the Supreme Court took those cases, they rejected all those. And you could say it was because the Supreme Court changed hands. It was after that that all of a sudden we saw the campaign to delegitimize everything that the Supreme Court had done. So they have the opportunity now, they think, to say that everything that came down during that period will uh, be treated as just politics. Well, if, if you take a look and see over the next 30, 40 years, most of the people who are on the Supreme Court get appointed by Democratic presidents or liberal presidents. Are we then going to see a resurgence of this great respect for what the Supreme Court says simply because the Supreme Court is more likely to buy these arguments? Well, the respect for the Supreme Court seems to vary as uh, uh, depending on whether uh, <laughs> the issue is, say, abuse of executive power or the constitutionality of uh, some law that Obama supported, or whether it's like gay rights, or whatever. So there's no, there's no, there are a few consistent mm -hmm. critics of the court uh, out there, uh, but uh, uh, but certainly on the liberal side. Um, you know, if you look at the surveys, the year they strike down something like, or they like uh, the campaign finance laws in Citizens United, uh, all of a sudden all the liberals hate the court. And the next year they uphold gay marriage, and all the liberals love the court. It's all driven by the outcome. But as far as the um, right to income, I think the one thing we do need to be concerned about is that issue. That that particular thing is not coming back. I don't think you're going to see no matter how liberal the court gets an argument the Fourteenth Amendment. Mm -hmm due process clause supports the right to minimum income. But what is the trend on the liberal left is to look to international bodies, international law. So why did Harold Coe ultimately 
trash his own theory of, that he was known for for 30 years of no unilateral uh, exercise of the war power by the president. And one, we, I, I speculate about that in the book, and I think it's informed speculation. My speculation is the Libya war was the perfect war if you're a liberal internationalist who doesn't believe in American sovereignty, doesn't believe in the American Constitution as restraining anybody. Why? Because Congress never said anything. Good. Con we don't have Congress authority. That's good. Why? Because instead we have the authority of who? The UN and the Arab League. And therefore... We're engaged in multilateralism, not this big bully America going out and acting as a sovereign, but we're part of the international community. And moreover, um, we were leading from behind, even better. We're not, we're, we're, we're not doing it out of national interest, we're just letting other people take the lead. So uh, that's really appalling, that's worse. I mean, I would love to just say, be able to tell you that Harold Coe is an opportunist who just changed his mind because it was politically convenient. I, th I think that's probably wrong. I think he probably, it's worse. He uh, doesn't believe in American sovereignty and the Constitution. What does that have to do with the question? Well, it's also this idea that a lot of the things that we have in our Constitution should be overridden by international human rights treaties. So a right to go in and make them. Well, there's some you know, UN Declaration of Human Rights and God knows what else that says that everyone has a right to live in human dignity with a certain income. Well, We'll use that instead. Uh, First Amendment doesn't allow for bans on hate speech. Well, who cares what the First Amendment says? Harold Cohen himself has said this. We should stop looking to the U.S. Constitution and start looking to international agreements and international law. So the trend to look out for, if a Democrat does win uh, the next election and starts appointing justices, is not whether they're going to revive the theories of the Warren Court, but whether they're going to do uh, this nouveau stuff, which is basically ignore the U.S. Constitution in favor of international uh, considerations that have nothing to do with the U.S. Constitution, basically. Okay. Um, my question is on document production. Okay. My question is on document, document production, which is, um, in, in particular, uh, I'm thinking, like, we know the White House had many briefings by the IRS, you know, Lewis, Lois Lerner kind of stuff. And so far as I know, we've been totally unsuccessful at getting any information on that, or very little. Likewise, um, uh, the slow walking of declassification when, you know, I'm just thinking I, when, okay, uh, you understand, you know, the basic sure. issue of we have an opposition in Congress in order to get the stuff, it appears you have to go to Eric Holder <coughs> and cause Eric Holder to enforce your desire to get the documents, and it's not entirely stunning that Eric doesn't see that as a priority. Right, so this has not, to say the least, been the promised most transparent administration in history. That's a laugh line right now, because uh, even, the pre even the Obama administration's friends in the media says, boy, this has been <coughs> the hardest information uh, administration we've ever seen to get information out of, to get a straight answer out of. Uh, they reject document requests. I mean, Eric Holder, this is, I, don't, I, I didn't even realize this until I researched my book, and I don't know how this <coughs> didn't come to my attention just from just reading the newspaper and whatever, but you know, Eric Holder was held in contempt by the House of Representatives. And of course, most, a lot of people say, well, that's just partisan, political, whatever. Most Democrats didn't vote against it. Now, they wouldn't be seen as voting for it, but they, most Democrats actually abstained, which means they're like, yeah, we can't go and vote for it, but we really do think that Eric Holder is acting in contempt of Congress. And what do you do when you, I mean, I, I'm actually just pondering this on the car ride over here today. How much of the, what I say in the book is Eric Holder's fault? Eric Holder was a terrible attorney general, uh, and he did a lot of bad things. And I'd say probably 35 40%. <laughs> uh, it, it could be put on Holder. And it's not just things he directly did, but there are a lot of crazy things that people were doing in the administration, lower-level people, that Holder should have been the adult in the room and said, hey, you know, maybe it's not a good idea, for example, to argue to the Supreme Court that churches don't have any constitutional right to appoint, to decide who their ministers will be. So, like, literally, the Catholic Church could be required to hire male, uh, female priests or whatever in San Francisco or, or, or some of the liberal jurisdiction under the argument that the Justice Department made. Where is the adult in the room saying, this is a crazy argument, every single court that's ever ruled on this has ruled the opposite, and not surprisingly, the Supreme Court ruled 9-0. So there's some sins of commission and some sins of omission by Holder, and he certainly bears a significant respons amount of responsibility for uh, what's talked about in the book. Let me exercise the prerogative and ask the last question then, uh, following up on what you just said, uh, as well as something you said earlier. To what extent are the problems created by a lost sense 
of a duty not just to party, but to the nation as a whole. Uh, if you had an attorney general, for example, who said, no, uh, we're not going to take this position because it is in the long-term interests of the government to do something else, uh, regardless of what our short-term political interests are, we might not have had some of these problems. You might have had an attorney general that said to the president, no, we're not going to take this position, or no, you can't take that position, or as Bob Mueller and uh, the attorney general said, you can take that position, but if you do, we're going to resign. Uh, I, I think that was Attorney General Laft Cross. Uh, we're not going to be a part of a government that takes <coughs> this position because we think it's just so fundamentally wrong. To what extent is that the problem, and how can we <coughs> overcome that? Is it only by electing a president who we are confident will serve the nation's interests ahead of our own? And if that's the only way, how can we be sure that a candidate out there is going to be able to do that? I'm afraid I don't have any good news here. Uh, the, I mean, it is true, it is disappointing uh, to many of us, I think, even, you know, just on purely non -ideolog ideological grounds, that despite all the controversies that have been in the Obama administration, I don't know there's a single example where anyone has not only resigned or even threatened to resign. Surely someone must have objected somehow to some of this, and yet uh, no one took enough of a principled stand to either get the administration to back down or even to threaten to resign. And it is to the credit, I mean, whatever you think of the actual legal arguments, there are some Bush administration officials who just said, this particular theory of executive power is so ridiculous, in my, in my opinion, so extreme that we can't def I can't defend it, I can't be part of the administration. If you go forward with it, we're going to have to resign and we're going to have to say why we resigned. Uh, and you know, you want people like that. Even if you disagree with them in the particular case, you want people like that in office. And this administration doesn't seem to have them. And I'm hoping it's just an anomaly, but I'm afraid on the left that um, it's actually a product of the ideology that has been circulating for a long time about law being politics. Well, it's just politics. Why would you ever resign over it? If there's no independent value to the rule of law. Why would you ever resign over a disagreement about law? Ultimately, it's just political. Uh, and I'm afraid, you know, that the temptation for Republicans is, has always been, uh, in many, you know, well, if they do it, why should they get the benefit of doing it? We should just do it too. And I can't, I'm not a political expert. I've seen explanations of the Trump phenomenon, which baffles me, uh, <laughs> as being related to this. Well, we want a strong man. Obama, a lot of people feel Obama's government is a strong man, ignores everybody, and does whatever he wants. We want someone who has the same personality, similarly narcissistic and self-absorbed and knows what they want and is going to go and do it. And that's distressing. Well, listen, please join me in thanking the professor, and if you have not yet gotten a copy of his book, I recommend it very highly. We have copies to be sold outside. Thank you, professor. We appreciate you coming here.